announce um, that there is an audio video recording of this meeting and also we have Ruth McGrath who is Hi. recording for um, North Street Association for Adam Cohen. Um, approval of the minutes of September 16th. We move to uh, accept the minutes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, new to our Committee on Social Services and Veterans Affairs, um, we are welcoming Carl, I'm hoping I got the last name right, Signoli? Signoli. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, close. We want to thank you for being here. And you're going to be talking about the following, um, about what the program is all about, and you can say what your title is, and what services are available for the residents that you apparently have set up in your program, and what involvement with working with the city of Northampton that you have. So. Sure. Well, I'm Carl Signoni. I'm a reintegration manager at the uh, Hampshire Sheriff's Office, which is the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction. And uh, this is Tim Mullen. Hello again. Thank you. And, uh, Tim also is a reintegration manager. He also uh, coordinates the membership program. Welcome. Thank you. This is uh, Councilor Casey. I'm, I'm late. I just leaving the conference committee and the stormwater. I, I know. I just told them I thought you were there because that email came in to everybody yeah. today. <laughs> okay, I apologize for being late. That's all right. Oh. So I'm Carl Signoni from the Hampshire Sheriff's Office. Yeah. Why? So it's it's the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction. Yeah. And this is Tim Mullen. Tim works with me. He's also, we Mullen. both work in the reintegration program there, yeah. which is to help men with their release plans, help them get connected. Uh, in terms of the services, support they need when they get out, and try to get them leaving in the, the best position possible so that they do well when they get out. Okay. I guess Sheriff Garvey's uh, a good quote he said is that, that hopefully we try to help the inmates leave as a better person than when they came in. You know, that we can help in terms of being correctional, you know, not punishment. He hey. says being there is punishment, and then we're there to try to help them change. Sheriff Garvey has actually sent me many people from there and I have trained them and they have become my competition. Oh, okay. Some have, some haven't. But competition in, in your work? In construction, construction, in building and yeah. Right. And I also have uh, a couple of landscapers on my ward who also use the in, um, residents from the Hampshire County Jail up there for landscaping and that and the report I get back is that they're excellent. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, I was going to get to the work release part of it and, yeah. and as we go along. Um, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to try to do a summary. Uh, just You probably already know this, but the, 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 this the jail house correction. So the jail is for, uh, it's like pretrial uh, holding, but if the court really owns the, the men, you know, we hold them. And they can be released from court or they can bail out or whatever. We don't really have a lot of control over that. So the men we work with are the men that are sentenced. So they've, already, they've been to court, they've been convicted, they have a sentence to the House of Correction. And they have to stay there for a period of time? Yeah. Yeah. And usually for House of Correction, it's, the sentence can't be longer than two and a half years. Mm -hmm. If it's more serious, they go to state prison. And uh, Except sometimes they can get uh, on and after sentences. They get two and a half years for this and another two and a half years for that. So they might be with us for five years. What should they do, Carl? Say if they have family and they have children, are they allowed to go home like on the weekends with their family? Um, not until they have worked their way or like done well in treatment and kind of um, made it to minimum security and then we can classify them to pre-release status, which um, then they can request a furlough. But it's not, it's only for 12 hours, so it can't be, you know, it might be from 9 in the morning till 9 at night. And they have to have a sponsor that we check out and make sure it's a kind of a competent, trustworthy sponsor uh, that would be responsible for them for that period of time. So that would even include like Christmas and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, we'll give Christmas, Thanksgiving for a long Um We have a pretty liberal visiting program, so the families can come up visit I think maybe two or three times a week and um, I'm 
jumping ahead a little bit. We have a program called Fathers and Their Child, where the, the children can come you know, with somebody that focuses more on the, the dads and the children to be together. Um, and then the, the mother, the wife, the grandmother, whatever, kind of sits and watches what's really cool. Right the there? Dads and the kids. You mean they'll yeah, just come up there? The house mm-hmm. correction. And the A to Z science store from um, King Street, yep. they work with us. So they'll bring in a game and everything they need for the fathers and kids to play some sort of um, kind of educational game. You know, so they're kind of learning about science and the dads can interact with their kids. That's excellent. Some of the guys have said it's the first time they ever get down on their knees with their, with their son. With their yeah, it must be pretty hard yeah. for them, you know, to know that, yes, they've done something wrong, and now they're going to be there for a year or two years, and their whole lifestyle has changed. Right. Well, also, if, you're, if your kids are really young and you're away for a couple of years, they change so much. That's you know, mean. the difference between two and five, the children is. So that's why this program here is that you're keeping the interaction between the father and the children, correct? Yeah. That's and we're really trying to help the men stay in the valued role of the father. And mm-hmm. they can kind of stay, but we can go back to that and continue with the women together. But anyway, so currently, I think this was as of today, we've had 82 inmates in the jail on the pretrial side, and the sentenced, uh, we had 163 men that have been sentenced there. And out of those 163, 143 are in the treatment program. Now, the, the, the they can elect to be in the treatment program, or they can uh, kind of elect not to. If they, if they aren't, they don't get very good time. So they don't get time off their sentence for a big behavior. What type of a treatment program? Okay, we just to get to they must be very And then, um, so in treatment, there's 105 guys currently in medium security, and 36 in minimum security. And then two men are out on the bracelet, selective monitoring program. And uh, within minim- in the minimum security, 10 men are working right now in the work release. And they work up, two of our big work release employers, well, they're not really big, but they are working with hiring guys. It's Ralph's Blacksmith Shop and Florence Casting Company. And then so you said some landscaping companies, like Proverbs Landscaping. So if they go out to do construction work or landscaping or anything like that, they have to wear a bracelet? Um, you know, we're just starting that. Oh, okay. okay. Um, generally, I mean, we keep pretty close tabs on them. And I think now we're going to start having a GPS. And, uh, we, we may get, we may get out of that here. I don't know. We'll see what happens there. Okay. Well, the police and the fire department here and the truck going out. So okay. find out if it's us. <laughs> Memorial Hall, if you see Stone is standing outside there. Okay. Just well, like a treatment program, we work with the men in there. We call it, you know, they have criminal thinking, so we work with them on their attitude and their mindset to try to um, help them move towards more pro-social and anti-social. Um, and then Tim's going to talk a bit about substance abuse. When I look at who gets out every month, probably almost close to 100% of the men have some sort of substance abuse problem. Um, maybe that's the nature of who gets sent to the House of Correction. Um, but maybe, you know, in a given month or quarter, maybe 90, 95% of the guys either have alcohol or drug problems. And so, just to touch bases on that just for a second, what we try to do is basically have them, have them address the exact nature of their problem, okay? So, what that boils down to is, is usually like Kyle just talked about, most of them have a substance abuse issue. Maybe be heroin, crack, alcohol, uh, prescription drugs, or something of that nature. So what we try to do is we, we run different groups and programs to talk about that, to address that issue, to try to get them to uh, identify with the problem that they have, admit they have a problem, and then try to find out what the solution is. Okay. Um, we find that, that the guys come in and uh, sometimes they're in denial, they feel as though they don't have a problem with substance abuse, um, or they can get high successfully and use drugs successfully, but when you look back at their track record, they've been in and out, in and out a number of times, and um, it's all because they've been, they chose uh, to use drugs. Now, I, I try to ask them a question, um, and the question that I ask them is, is why are you using drugs, okay? 
and um, they'll say because they want to get out, you know. But and that that might be a logical answer to them. But uh, uh, I ask, well, how can you stop from coming back to jail? And they don't have an answer for that question. So what I try to let them know is that, okay, so a lot of people don't put drugs and jail together. Okay, they don't put those two elements together. They'll put crime and jail together. They know if they commit a crime and they get caught, that they're going to jail. But the question after that is, well, why are you committing crimes? Well, I'm committing crimes so I can get money to use drugs. Okay, so, so okay, so what we're going to try to do is this. If we can get you to stop using drugs, then that will lower the odds of you coming back to jail. Because you're not committing crime anymore to get money for drugs. Okay. So when they, I, I say that to them and they think about it, they say, okay, that makes sense. You know, so what happens is we introduce them to Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. We sit down and run groups and talk about the exact nature of their problem. We get them to address the issue, find out what the solution is. You know, to apply that solution to their life. And once they do, they're able to try to start recovery. And once they get into recovery, they feel as though, okay, I'm not using drugs anymore. Now I'm trying to get a job. Now I'm trying to be a productive, positive member of society and the community once again. Now I'm not committing crime to get money for drugs. And now what happens? I'm not going back to jail. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a simple process for complicated people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you try to explain that to me. How long does it take to, for somebody to actually get better? If they're on drugs, how long does it take to clean out somebody's system? Well, that's there's a, a difference question. between, it may not take that long physically, but it's really more the, right. the, the psychological, psychological of the addiction in the mind mm -hmm. and the lifestyle. and. If you return when you leave to the same environment, you know that you came from when you were using drugs, or it's you know it's more likely that it's going to be hard to resist. But geography has a lot to do with it. Geography and your friends, um, you know, even maybe your family. Mm -hmm. um, but guys will also say just that the ge geographic change often isn't just enough either. You know you can find it wherever you right. are. So you have to work on your yourself, strengthen yourself. So I have a saying that I use, and, and the saying is, is that I talk to the guys about is, is get your mind right. Okay, I use that on a regular basis. With them. And when when I say that, they they look at me and they laugh because they don't know the significance of it. Okay, so I let them know right. I said the same way that you come to jail, and you 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 get clean, and you get the drugs back out of your system. Now you start getting healthy again. You're going out to the gym, and you're working out, and you're getting your body and your muscles back in in, in order. But in, in but in the same time. Your mind still isn't right, okay? You're still thinking about the disease of addiction. You're still thinking about using and getting high while you're here. So it doesn't matter what you do to this, okay? If this isn't right when you get out, you're going to fall right back into the same trap, mm -hmm. and you're going to end up breaking this back down again, and the odds are you're going to end up going back to jail, and you're going to end up dead. But we were just educated in that about the brain itself and moving right to that and how critical it is of anybody going on drugs, how it affects the brain. Yeah. So I try to tell them the same way you exercise your body, to exercise your, your mind the same way. Read the literature that we have within the facility to give to you. Um, practice in your head time and time again. Tell, you, tell yourself, I'm not going back to the same people, places, and things. I'm going to try something different this time. Do it repetitively over and over on a daily basis. Because they didn't just become addicts and one day they, they weren't born addicts and they didn't wake up and say I want to be an addict. It was a behavior that they that they learned from watching somebody else. And it became a part of their moral fiber. So you have to learn, you have to retrain the brain the same way to say no to that temptation. So on the uh, I, I, I want to be clear on the statistics that you're citing with ninety percent uh, of the inmates experiencing some form of substance abuse issue, but they're not necessarily in for drug crimes. They're they're supporting a habit, so it may be B and E's, it may be uh, yeah, larcenies, larcenies or, it, right. or OUIs and things like the cumulative OUIs and and it's not so much that they've been busted with holding. 
so it's more people we're serving for that's what I'm trying to figure out is it are you serving a lot of inmates who are actually busted for drugs as opposed to being drug busted for habit support um, I'd say both but you're right if you look at the guys like the incarceration but what they get convicted of or even their history you won't often see like possession of class A or whatever it's a lot of like larcenies being in the nighttime uh, shoplifting so it's really the oh, related to the drugs. Related to the drugs, yeah. but if you look behind, you find right. out they're, they're, they're an addict right. and they're stealing, and they haven't been stealing for quite a while, and they're stealing for the drugs. We do have, I should say, out of the, everyone in treatment there, we also um, have 40 men at the jail, probably the Department of Correction inmates. They're state inmates, and the whole philosophy is all the state prisons are in Eastern Mass, and we want them to release close to their home community to do their release work and help get connected. And out of the state guys, a lot more of them have, um, they may not have a big addiction problem. Uh, they're more in for the trafficking or possession with intent to distribute. So they're more the higher up drug dealers mm -hmm. that uh, maybe are addicted to the lifestyle. Um, some of them do have an addiction problem. Um, some may only, they say, well, I only I smoke weed sometimes or I drink socially, but they're still part of that culture in a big way. You know, we try to help them see the impact they have in the community, even if they say, you know, I don't do it myself, but and, uh, they'll say, well, I'm, you know, I'm just making, I'm making it available, but these people are making their own decisions. And so, you know, you know and we try to make them see how it ripples through the community, you know, as the self parents. I suspect that you guys, you know, you have to work that out for them because you know, even if they do go into recovery or be successful in sobriety, then they have the stigma of, 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 of having served time, being right. reintroduced back into a community which actually puts up a variety of constraints against or has, has a bias of, against people who have been busted for, for anything or ever served time. So consequently, their job searches, their their social service access becomes even more limited at some level. So yeah, it's it's a reality that they yeah. have to deal with. With now, um, I mean, back in the day, you could relocate and get a fresh right. start, or maybe you didn't have a reputation, people didn't know you. But now, you know, people can get before you, right? Or they can Google your name, and right? See exactly. You can get around the world. And, you know, we work with the guys, Tim and I, on um, not letting that get them down, you know, try to stay positive. We have to, we try to put emphasis on don't let that be a stumbling block. Right, don't, to, don't to let that be an excuse. Right, for because they will use that as an excuse. They use that as an excuse on a regular basis to defeat themselves before they even leave the facility. Right, right. You know, I have a criminal history. Um, people are going to look down on me. Um, you know, my the records of my past, I've burned so many bridges. You know, and so they don't even put forth the effort to try for themselves to give themselves the benefit of the doubt. And, and we have a pretty good program up there to give them solutions and information that can overcome that. Okay, um, just quickly, and I'll make it quick, brief. I'm the end result of what can happen if you do change. I'm a recovering addict myself. I was first incarcerated in 1974, last incarcerated in 2004. And today I work for the Sheriff's Department in the state of Massachusetts as a full-time employee with full benefits. Okay, and I have a criminal history that stretches from here to Six Flags and back. Okay. <laughs> so Look at me. Okay. I spent 87 days in the Hampshire County House of Correction. So, yeah, so change is possible. In 1993, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a family structure to get out when I got out. Yes. Of course, traumatic experiences really do this to you. My father drowned in the Connecticut River, and I found him at 9.30 at night. He, we lost him all day, couldn't find him. And when I swam back to shore with him, I went right off the deep end. Alcohol, cocaine. But here I am today. Uh, I got elected to the city council two terms ago. I'm still here. Um, and But you have to want that, though. You really have to want it. You know, uh, you have to get over. You have to get over some of this stuff. You know, you have to put it in the back of your head and move on. Um, hey, I rode around on a bicycle. I lost my license for three years. I carried plywood on a bicycle. 
and did construction jobs and stayed with it. And so you have to show the community that you're really doing what you need to do. Um, and a lot of, but if a guy gets out of, out of the Hampshire County House of Correction, he has no family structure or unit to go back to, and he doesn't have any support on the outside, chances are very, very good he's going to go right back, or she, he's going to go right back to where they were in the first place. But I never, I never got convicted of any crime. Or I never stole anything or anything like that. Um, just wrong place at the wrong time. And, uh, and that's the way it goes. Well, the, the guys that have the hardest, the biggest hurdles, so like you said, guys that don't have um, a social network, family or friends, and don't have any money, you know, and they're, they're getting out. Um, what they can do, and, and again, it's depending on their mindset, you know, if they let that get them down, um, it, it's easy to go back to your, maybe your friends that are not going to be the right friends. But well, how yeah. do you treat? But, well, what those guys, what we try to do But how do you treat a situation like he just stated, Councilor Tracy? You said that you had a problem with alcohol and cocaine. So if I went in there with that problem, how do you treat somebody with two different types of behaviors? Actually, the cocaine was no big deal. It was the booze that was the toughest thing to quit. The booze. Well, we kind of address both the different recovery yeah. groups. I, I guess the snapshot of the day is the men spend a good part of their day in, in different treatment groups or um, indoor school. We have a really good education program yeah. as well. So they'll be in groups for alcohol, alcoholism and recovery, and drug addiction and recovery. And there is some difference, but a lot of men find like going to AA meetings helpful for both. And we'll have meetings in the house correction. We actually have people from community from the camp and come up and do meetings. And then guys in minimum security, we take out to meetings. So we'll take them down uh, right next door to the Unitarian Church for the noontime meeting. If guys are in work release, they go to the early meeting at the Florence Civic Center, community center. And then after work, they have to go down to the community corrections, which is down um, across from the Bowling Alley, down at the sheriff's mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. And then we take them to meetings after work. Because we want, to, want them to know you can work hard all day, Right. come home exhausted and still go to a meeting. Right. And they meet people there that do the same thing. They work hard all day and they go to a meeting. But you got to remember, Ed, that's a, that is a, a great facility. The Hampshire County Jail House of Correction. So it is a great what. facility yeah. for rehab. And if you use it as that, if you actually yeah. go in and you use it as a, as a rehab facility, yeah. you're going to do well. If you're going to go in there and, and trust me, I was, you know, tough guy and all, so they think that, uh, well, anyway, you can't do that. you got to go up there and you have to realize that you are here for a freaking reason. Yeah. Right. And, and you either want it or you don't. Mm -hmm. Now, some guys come in with an attitude like, I don't need this. Yeah. Um, right, but you were saying some of them. I'm getting a little confused well, here. I think you we, did state that they get the help inside, mm -hmm. but then they go back outside again because the brain is telling them differently. So they go back out and have a beer or whatever, and that starts up again. Well, these, are, these are people very much like us. They're us. And in fact, most of the people who are incarcerated, as, it, as these gentlemen have pointed out, are it's largely due to a disease, which is addiction. Mm -hmm. And it's if you consider it like diabetes, yeah. it's, it's a treatable addiction, but we, we've historically treated it as a crime, mm -hmm. but when in fact it results in crime and criminal behavior or desperate behavior because uh, mostly to support the, the, the addiction. And what these gentlemen are devoted to doing is one, navigating the issues of addiction mm -hmm. and then navigating the issues of reintegration into a community that has, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 well, the absence of support in, in the fact that there's a bias, there's a, there's a prejudice to people who have served in not recognizing the people very similar to us, and as Gene has pointed out, I mean, we we you know, you when you're in jail, you're considered a criminal, and consequently, you are a separate person from the uh, law-abiding, uh, uh, you know, upright people. Um, but that's simply not the case, and that's always the argument that it's been very difficult right. to make. And and it was what led me to my question, which was, I mean, I, you guys clearly have your work cut out for you, and we do have one of the most progressive. Uh, county uh, 
jail systems in, in the country, by my reckoning, and with with the mindset towards reintegrating valuable people back into the community with a sense of value themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think more importantly, what we should be asking you is what could we do to help establish that sense of value or to reinforce that sense of value that you guys are capable of starting to foster in some of the people that you've been working with? You know, where do we come up short? Because the place actually, I feel the place saved my life. It did. I really do. Now, a lot of guys that Sheriff Garvey has sent me, and um, uh, uh, Cal Lane, um, they were heroin addicts. And they, and they worked for me, and they subsequently, two of them died. Not while in my employ, yeah. but uh, after they left and they took off. One went to Florida. Uh, he was from Williamsburg, and another one was a, a son of a local school teacher. Uh, he was found in a room over on West Street. This just recently? In the, yeah, in the last few years. Uh, it happens. And it, it happens. Yeah. The, the heroin is a terrible yeah. addiction, I, which is something I, don't, I, I really don't know anything about, except for that they've worked for me. I never tried or got any, any I, never, I don't have any experience with it at all, personally. But I don't see that. As anything, I find that difficult to believe that there's actually a cure for that. Well, they, they, you, you, you never cure. Yeah. yeah. You never cure. One day at a time. One day at a time. Absolutely. You can put it under arrest, but it, you're, you're never cured. You're, you're, I'll always be, I'll always be an addict, but today I'm a recovering addict. Right? Even if you're recovering on a synthetic I'm element, well, such as methadone. I've been on that too before, one day, but I, I really don't condone that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the best thing that, that was ever introduced to me was the process of narcotics anonymous family recovery. Yeah. Plain and simple. Absolutely. Know, come on, going on over nine years now without a drink or a drug. Wow. Okay. By God's grace and mercy. Right. And look at yourself. You know, I mean. You know. So you know, I, I try to stand it as a, as an example of the power of what recovery and a higher power would do for you. If you just allow it to come into your life. So just to answer your question real quick, you know, what we try to do is just introduce them to the process. Show them that, the, that change is possible, recovery is possible, even though it's scary to them. And what they do with it after that is, is their choice, okay? We, you know, plant the seed, it's up to them to nurture it, water it, cultivate it, and let it grow and prosper. Thanks, Tim. You asked what could the city do. Yeah. Um, one of our programs that Tim and I Started well. We started with Sheriff Garvey and Kathy Calhoun and a bunch of people. It's a mentorship program. So what we do is we recruit mentors from the community uh, that will enter into a mentorship relationship with the men inside. And we try to do it where the men have at least six months left, so the relationship gets strong. And then the real critical time is when the men get out. You know that they stay in touch and work with their mentors once they're released and the mentor helps them through the difficult period of adjusting um, back and help them a lot with their, even with their thinking, with their decision making. But also mentors can help them get a job, you know, using their personal networks. Um, That's what Michael Michael Barnes. Yeah, yeah, Michael's a, yeah. one of our mentors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, Very good mentor. Yeah. And so we're always looking for more mentors. Um, but that's not a service. I mean, it's a, it's a program, but it's a voluntary thing. You know, where people, we just really like to go talk to groups and talk to people and try to recruit mentors that way. Um, we do work with the social service agencies in our camp, and ServiceNet is one of our main uh, agencies in terms of mental health counseling, but also the drop in the drop in well, now it's called the Cancer Resource Center. It used to be the drop in yep. center at 43 Center Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guys, like you mentioned, don't have a place to live, don't have family, don't have money, often go to Grove Street Inn, and then they can get their feet on the ground and uh, hopefully get a job, get working. Or if they're, if they're willing, we try to we get them into Harrison House, which is the halfway house. Um, we call it a residential recovery program down on the Graves yeah. Ave. But again, this, they're, they're a small, it's a good program, but they're relatively small. They can only take so many guys from the jail because they take people in recovery 
trying to get in recovery from all over. Do you have veterans also? And then for the veterans, they're a bit, um, actually, so the, I was going to say they're more fortunate because Soldier On, the, which is located up at the grounds mm -hmm. of the VA, is a really good program. And they always have openings for the veterans. If the veterans want to go there from jail, they can go there. They're either there or their Pittsfield <coughs> place. With Cherry Street also? Yep. yep. We've had guys go to Cherry Street. Uh, but guys have paroled there, paroled will work with them. And then we also work with the, uh, the local veterans program with uh, uh, Steve and Joe Russo. Yep. Uh, Steve Connor and Joe Russo will come in. And they help with just connecting to the other veterans services, making sure they get their veterans uh, benefits. And uh, we do a lot. And then we work with the VA directly as well. So the veterans have some pretty good support in place if they're willing to, to go there. Most of them are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's been a really good thing. But, you know, the, the numbers, I mean, the veterans are a small percentage of the, you know, the men there. I think maybe we have 20 or so veterans there. Uh, I do want to say, uh, I looked at who's, out of all of our releases in the last quarter, <coughs> I think maybe 22% of the return to North Hampton, which is about right because it's Hampshire County. Yep. People number one back to where, um, and then, you know, this guy's going to East Hampton, Yammer, Spelter Town. And then if, uh, maybe about the same, maybe 20, 15, or 20% of the <coughs> County. So they go back to Holyoke, Springfield, Chicopee, and there. They just happen to you know, commit their time in Hampshire County. Right. So they went through North Hampton District Court of Hampshire I know when Ted Keller mentions about you and the <coughs> programs that you do, she said that it was really good to bring you into social services and veterans affairs to see what the city could do, how we can work with you. Maybe Council of Dwight can help me out around about the mentoring part of it. Who would we know about it? Well, I think the mentoring program is available to any, any citizen in the community, I would imagine. Right? Well, so yeah. 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 We don't have women at the jail. Okay. They have to go point. to the Chicopee yeah. women's facility, so we only match men with men to just because. You know, but, you have it already. <laughs> but you already have mentors. We have right? some. We always need more. You always need. I, I have right now. I have at least 13 guys on my case though, right now that are, are looking for mentors. Okay. They're looking for what? They're looking for mentors. Mm -hmm. They're looking for mentors. Um, they see me on a daily basis and ask me, "Can you know, can I get a mentor without the application?" And uh, I just have to tell them to be patient. You know, we're out in the community trying to recruit to get more guys again. Um, some of the mentors, some of the mentors, they have their mentor mentees already, and the relationship runs its course, and um, uh, they take on another mentee. You know, so. But the more mentors that we have, the better, the better it is. Um, and, and, and that's important because. It, it gives them an opportunity to connect with somebody that they can have trust in and feel comfortable about about going to their problems when that crazy thought comes in their head when they get released. You know, they've been talking to this person on a regular basis. We have to, the mentor comes into the facility for one hour a week to sit down and talk to the person about their problems. Uh, they have a personal relationship, a personal conversation. Whatever is said between the mentee and the mentor is between just those two. The only time the mentor comes to us with an issue is if the mentor talks about hurting himself or somebody else, and then we step in. Um, and we just hope that they form a very close relationship. And the meat and potatoes is, is that when they take that relationship back into the community. Okay, when the individual gets out, um, and like I say, that crazy thought comes in his head, instead of acting on that thought, he calls his mentor up. And he says, listen, you know, I'm having a problem getting a job. I'm having a problem doing this. I'm having a problem doing that. You know, uh, what should I do? And the mentor will either talk to him on the phone until that, that emotion or that feeling passes, or they'll come get him, take him to get coffee or whatever out here in the community. And before you know it, you know, that's, that's one more day that this person has stayed clean, one more day he didn't commit a crime, one more day that he didn't, he didn't go back to jail. You know? um, a mentor was, was definitely the major key in my life. I was introduced to a mentor 
back in 05 when I was my last incarceration um, at, in, at Ludlow. Um, and because I met that mentor, there's no question. There's no question in my mind that if I didn't meet that mentor, I'd be dead today. There's no doubt. So, as far as a mentor up here in Northampton Jail, mm -hmm. it has to be a male. Yes, it has to be a male. Because we just don't want to take the chance on the conflict of interest. Okay, we just. That's the what? Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be a male. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, uh, we keep males with males, females with females. That's how we keep it. And safer that way. You know, another um, big need, well, housing, for the yeah, less less affordable good. housing. Um, and I know, um, and also, Harrison House is a great program, but they're also recovery based. You have to have substance abuse. No, not all the guys. I said a high percentage, but not all of them have substance abuse. Yeah, they're coming tonight, committee meeting next month. Okay. Good. But uh, there's always a need. For, it's the only Harrison House is the only house like that in Hampshire County, um, and so there's a need for more. We call it transitional housing. Maybe not. That, I mean, I envision one that would have recovery programs, but not make it an absolute requirement. So for guys that have other problems, you know, could go there. Particularly guys that have no place to go, don't have a f social or family network, and um, just need a healthy place to go until they can get working. You know, get their feet on the ground and then move, get their own place. So, so if you good. become a mentor, are you given at least part of a history of somebody just in case there might be yeah, like a I behavior I problem? Yeah, I, I, I sit down with you. I, I let you. I let the, the individual look over their application. Oh, okay. I, I have a list of of recommendations that the jail has given this this caseworker that he's working with. On what he should be doing, whether it, it is, is substance abuse, domestic violence, uh, anger management, uh, criminal behavior, whatever it may be, I sit down and talk with you about that before I match you with the me with the mentee. Okay. Um, let you know what you're about to step into and who you're about to be dealing with. Um, I also tell you the do's and the don'ts. There's a there's a small brief training session that you have to go through at the facility. That, that covers the basis of everything that, that you're going to run across uh, while you're coming in and out of the facility. Um, and basically, um, if at any given time, if you're in a relationship with a mentee and you feel as though you're not making a difference or the mentee feels as though that you're not the right match for him, all you do is just come and sit down and talk to me about it. And just as fast as you got matched with that person, I separate the match. I match the mentee with somebody else. I'm as the mentor with somebody else. No harm, no foul. Mm. Okay. It, and it what's the capacity uh, again? The capacity for... Yeah, how it many it inmates can you... Yeah. Well, there's, there's a, like a hundred... Well, it, you have to be in, tre in the treatment program to be to be matched with a mentor. And let's see, what did I... I think there's 145... Yes, you said 145 and then the people for free trial would not qualify for this. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's because of the fact that right, right. we don't know what they're... They're not convicted. Right, we don't know they're where they're going. Some of them may go right. different places. Right, and you don't know, I mean, but the thing is, you can't put them in a program that if we have a, if it hasn't been established by law that they're actually guilty, guilty mm -hmm. and needed. Now, out of the 145, I mean, we look when we're deciding who the management mentors, like who might need them the most. So somebody that might have, you know, strong family support, um, a job waiting for them when they get out, or a place to live. Um, even though it might still benefit them to have a mentor, if there's another guy that, you know, doesn't have anybody, um, uh, they would be the one that would match first. You know, the one that, that didn't have those, that social support network mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, other guys may not have a mentor, but they, they go to the community <coughs> AA meetings and they meet somebody and they and ask them to be a sponsor, and right. so they then have an AA sponsor. And we have a program where the sponsors can come in if the men are in pre-release status. Uh, it's called the escort program. The sponsor can come pick the guy up, take him out to meetings, have a cup of coffee. So you know, if, they already, if they have a sponsor through AA or NA, um, they probably wouldn't match him with a mentor at the same time. Even though the mentorship 
is a, a broader role than just a, a sponsor. You know, because the membership would work on a lot of other issues. Sponsors do that too, I guess. But um, so we really look at who is most in need out of all the men there. And some of the guys, unfortunately, say, "I don't want to uh, lead a men club." That's the um, challenge with the younger guys. There is they. They think they're invincible even though they're locked up. And a lot of them think, I can do it myself. I don't need help. And that's their biggest problem, right. is that mind thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't need mm -hmm. anyone mm -hmm. helping me. I don't need right. So do they get the help or not? Uh, we, do they finally We give them the help. I mean, they, it's a deal. They kind of, if they want to get their good time, they have to be in treatment. Mm -hmm. And some of them come to see the value of it. But when they're getting out, I'll say, you know, um, what so about going to And so once they go meetings? out, do they end up back there again? Um, some do. Yeah. I actually, we keep track of that, and um, I think in the last three, well, it's called recidivism, and um, what that means, really it means counts like who's come back to jail, like who's got, so it doesn't really mean, you know, do you have a job, do you have a healthy lifestyle, are you doing well, it really just looks at who's gotten reincarcerated, and um, for the guys that got out in 2009, looked at three years later, so it was like at the three-year benchmark, 31% had come back to jail. It's some, or been convicted, not just pre-trial. So mm -hmm. that's a little, about a third, I guess. Um, if you looked at one year, starting in 2010, the guys that got out in 2010, it was 15%. In 2011, it was 21%. In 2012, it was 12%. But okay. that's a year since they yep. got out. Three years, I guess the, the, all the research says if you, can, if you can, can manage to, you know, stay out of jail for three years, your chances are much better that you're going to be able to stay out and keep going in the right direction. But if you add up those three years that you just said, it's about 30 percent again, it's about a third. Yeah, so that's each year you can look at, okay, like 2010, we'd have to look at the end of 2013 yeah. for the, that group of guys. But you're right. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then we looked at out of all the men that got out who participated in the treatment program and found that they, their rate was uh, about 20% less than the guys that didn't participate in treatment. Even though the, the percentages, it was only, look out of the guys, there only 20 guys aren't in treatment and 145 are. But those are real numbers. But those are, yeah. So real numbers, if 20%? If men engage in the treatment, um, they're much more likely, they're 20% more likely to do well and to get out. So yeah. it's, you know, a little bit. Well, and what we like to do is break down the treatment, like in terms of, I know education is really important. We have a strong program. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I think the national rate's in the 40s. So. Well, and also recovery rate, too. I mean, sobriety, it's, it's up to you if you're using an AA modality even still, which is the most effective. Uh, right. That's you, you, you know, you're not knocking people's socks off with numbers of successes. It's been something with a 30 year chip. Mm -hmm. Those are few and far between. So it's, right. it's, it's a tough haul. It is a day to day, and it's moment to moment. Do you guys also do programming relative to issues surrounding violence? Um, um, things yeah. that might have actually gotten led them to. I mean, Statistically, 98% of all violent crimes are committed by men, and consequently, uh, the, uh, some, a lot of it has to do with cultural systems that reinforce violence expressed by men or using it as an alternative. Um, yeah. And that's always tricky. And, that <coughs> and the inability to cope with your emotions, given the fact that we're not really trained to cope with our emotions, also lends itself to make somebody get hot. Um, you either act out, we, we basically have three emotional ranges. We're stoic, or we act violently, or in anger, and or we get high. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much our limited space. And it's we have, um, and again, I looked at the numbers, and it was almost the same, like 90, 90 or so percent of the guys releasing um, had substance abuse problems, and about 90 percent had some sort of violence problems. And out of that, it was pretty much domestic violence. Right. Very few guys had just, you know, just gotten bar fights and stuff. Right. It was usually the domestic violence. And it seemed to be, you know, there's a relationship between the substance abuse and the domestic violence. Though, 
we're really clear with them, and some of them will say, well, I only, I only um, beat my wife when I get drunk. Right. Okay. And we say, well, okay. and then they think, well, if I can just stay Stick sober, then I'll solve that. Mm -hmm. And we say, no, you know, yeah. that's, yeah. It's maybe there's a relationship, but it's not that easy. You know, you've got to work on your, your ten violence tendencies. Tim um, leads a few of the uh, yeah. domestic violence groups. So. Yeah, I, I uh, co-facilitate two domestic violence groups, and um, it is a major problem and an issue, and what we try to do is we, we keep the focus on them. Because when they come into the group, they will try <coughs> to, to divert the focus off of them and talk about the victim, but we don't allow them to talk about the victim because the victim is the other defenders, okay, or to say her part of the story. So we keep it basically focused on them and dealing with their issues and what got them there and how they be, became, uh, uh, got into that situation. And it's a number of different things. Um, like Carl was just talking about, uh, their mindset is in different places at different times, and they will minimize what they've done. Okay, and we break it down to a, a point where we let them know that that uh, domestic violence isn't just physical. Okay, it's it's mental, it's emotional, it's financial. Um, you're in charge of the money. You know, she you're not letting her go to work. Uh, you're paying the cell phone bill, so you don't let her, you know, let her use the phone, um, uh, things of that nature, okay? And we're trying to address all these different issues. Um, I had a guy that would say, um, well, she was in my apartment, and, and I busted up my stuff, okay? I punched my hand through my wall, through my door. I kicked my TV, you know, and he would say, I, I never hit her, but I busted up all myself, busted up all my stuff that, was, that belonged to me. And we have to let them know that, okay, so you don't understand the, the, the mental scar that you're putting on this woman by doing that because she's sitting there terrified that after you get to busting up all your stuff and run out of your stuff to bust up, you that you're going to bust her up. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure she just didn't sit there eating a the sandwich while this was going on. No. Yeah. no. So we have to, and when I said that to him, he, you know, he would look at me like, you know, well, okay, but. I still didn't put my hands on it, you know. So it, it's it's an ongoing struggle to try to get them to identify and know that you know that what they're doing is, is wrong. That no means no, and and no woman whatsoever deserves to have uh, <coughs> your talk to that way, treated that way, disciplined in that manner, or or anything of that nature, or put your hands on. It. You know. So we 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 cover that. We have you know, domestic violence. Violence reduction and anger management. We try to cover all the bases. Mm. We try to give them some insight, and, and we do that by by going into their criminal history and looking at who violated restraining orders, who's in for assault and battery, you know, who's in for uh, um, other crimes of violence. And when we we identify that, then we mandate that they go to these different groups because they'll they'll say, well, you know, my my domestic violence was three or four years ago. Why am I in this group? You know, or, or um, I didn't, like, like I said, I didn't put my hands on it. Why am I in this group? Okay, well, because you were told to stay 100 feet away from her and you violated the restraining order. Okay, so, you know, just because you didn't put your hands on her, you still violated a, a protective order, which qualifies you to be in this group. You know, so. And the, um, again, the real key is when the guys leave. You know, we can have them in our groups at the jail and work with them as best we can. If guys have a uh, domestic violence problem or violence, we'll refer them to the, the Men Overcoming Violence Program. Now it's called Moving Forward. Right. And it's uh, part of service in that. <coughs> the problem is there's a, a pretty good waiting list to get into that. And also, I guess it won't, the uh, guy's health insurance won't pay for it. Cost money so too. it's out of pocket. And they'll do a sliding scale, you know, depending on your income. But um, that's another big need is for more programs to help guys with their, uh, like you said, it's almost like built-in cultural tendencies to solving problems with violence, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot, a lot. Or, or with uh, intimidation or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, I've got to say, there's no mass health coverage or no connector coverage. Well, we, we get guys, that's part of what we do in, in reintegration, we have guys start their mass health application two months before they're released so then it's ready when they get out to so leave with health insurance, or now it's going to be the, the 
We'll still now sell for the health care. For the care, right. health care yeah. so <coughs> that's really good. Unless guys, the, the benefit of work release is often the, like Ralph's and Florence Casket will offer health insurance right. to the men. And a lot of the men keep those jobs, you know, like, so they're, it's a, they're in good shape when they get out. But that particular program won't, um, for whatever reasons, it just doesn't work. They won't, aren't able to use their health insurance to pay for it. And uh, to be honest, I'm not sure if it's the program doesn't want to deal with health insurance or whether it just doesn't qualify as a, you know, from the, for the, from the insurer's point of view. But we need more of those. Um, and sometimes probation, if the men leave with probation, probation will mandate it as part of the probation stipulation. You know, we have to go to a, a violence reduction program. But not all the men leave with probation. With the, pardon? How long have you been working at the corrections? It was eight years in August. So it's eight years plus. Yeah. Coming up on four. Great job. Yeah. We in reintegration might supply them with everything they need to make a successful transition back into the community. We make sure that they have their masks off in place. Thirty days before they get out, the food stamp lady comes in and sets up their application. Uh, we give them make sure they have uh, a birth verification form. Okay, we're trying we're trying to get work back on getting the social security cards back in place. Okay, if they if they're in the minimum security people release facility and they have the money, we're able to take them to uh, the East Hampton to the registry of motor vehicles. Okay, and, and get them a mass ID or pay uh, on the fines that they owe to get their license reinstated. Okay, um, uh, we, have, we have job placement, give them all the information to, to the career center, everything they need. Okay, and we try to just put the emphasis on them that, that, you know, take these tools that we're giving you, right, apply them to your life, okay, and make the change happen for yourself. Plain and simple, okay, you know, but. As we talked about, you know, the, 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 there's other things going on in their heads, you know, and when they get out, the temptation of, of what's going on out in the community or where they just come from draws them back in, you know, and they end up recommitting crimes and coming back to jail. But uh, we do a very, very good job, you know, getting them what they need so they can be successful. And, and the city of Northampton is, is very instrumental in doing that. You know, and helping us with that. Well, is that we're interested in uh, whatever we can do. We don't, we don't actually don't subsidize social service programs. It's not part of it. Right. Municipalities can't do that. Yeah. But anything that we could do to facilitate grants, leveraging grants, providing community outreach for, uh, um, you know, community access and understanding of and education. You're doing education with you guys coming out. I don't think it would hurt to have some education for the folks who live down the road from the jail who have no idea about the challenges. Well, I'm just talking about citizens of the community being aware that that um, the best thing, the best support system you can provide for people transitioning out would be a supportive community as opposed to a community that mm -hmm. doesn't talk about the issues or doesn't address the issues, doesn't discuss because it's a scary thought in some cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I once visited, I was once up to the jail visiting, as a counselor that I was invited in that. We were doing a Q&A &A and, and, and two of the prisoners asked me, what do people think of us down there in, in town? And I said, people in town pay a lot of money not to think about you. That we pay, the taxes are paid to subsidize this jail so we, no one has to think about who's in here. I don't think that's necessarily a healthy attitude. Mm -hmm. Not thinking about the people in there or why they're in there. It's, it's, so that's, that's, I think, on some level, it would be helpful for us as a community to start to become more conscientious about the people who are serving there, are our neighbors. They are people that we know and see. Well, so. I, I um, live up in, lived in Williamsburg and Chesterfield. Well, in long, for a long time, I lived in Working there, a lot of the kids I coached, like in I coached Williamsburg, like youth baseball, I watched my kids play soccer. A lot of the young kids, not a lot, but some of the guys have been through the jail. They're young, they have substance, they drink, they got trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know them. I know them when they're little, I know them now. And you're right, like what you said is there, it's like you and me, it's they've got people just like us. But 
I think the community really not knowing or not wanting to know who the people are up there in '66. Peter Malinowski. And um, I think what they then they think it's what they see on TV, unfortunately, or in the yeah, media, exactly. and it's the worst. You know, it's like the worst of the worst. When I told my um, one of my sons that I was going to when I got, was going to work there eight and a half years ago, his immediate response was, "Dad, you're going to get killed." You know, and it's not like that at all. Like I, I don't feel uh, threatened when I'm there. You know, the guys are most. You know, I say all of them. Are, some of them might be dangerous, but you know, the large majority aren't that dangerous. They're guys. They have problems. They've made bad decisions. Most of them is substance abuse. Um, yeah, they, they, they just need some help. Yeah, we have a full-time nursing team that comes in and, and that, that's there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that you know, administers those of their need medication. We have a, a, a forensic clinician that evaluates anybody that has mental health issues. Uh, we do our intensive intake when they first come in the door to find out you know, what, what their problems are if they're going through withdrawal or anything of that nature. We try to address that issue with them. So, you know, they, they, they get the medical help that they need. You know, um, when an individual leaves, whatever medication that they may be on, um, uh, uh, the, the psychiatrist comes in every, every week. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. Every week. Um, they have a med clinic that comes in, evaluates those that have mental health issues, sits down and talks with them, prescribes the medication that they've been on while they've been on the street, if they came in using it from on the street, or if they're there and they have a history, they they get reintroduced to that. When an individual leaves, they get 30 days of free medication to take with them. Um, I make sure that uh, I give them a call to ServiceNet, set up their their appointments with their doctors, or, or their psychiatrists, or their clinicians, whoever they got to see, uh, so that they can follow up on that when they get out. You know, we make sure we cover all the bases and try not to let anybody slip through the cracks on any level whatsoever. You know. Um, but I just want to say very quick is that if you guys got any men's groups that need, you know, for us to come and talk about mentorship, we more than willing to come, come and talk. Uh, there's, there are a number of men's groups that actually have done some work with you. I know that Valley uh, published the magazine uh, Voicemail, M A L E, uh, Rob Oakham, and others. You guys work with them. It's mostly dealing with uh, violence and oppression of violence and, and uh, gender issues. So they would, Rob Oakum, uh, o, uh, O-K-U-N. Because <coughs> we'll always look at, you know, yeah, the, 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 the statement that you made that, that people are scared, you know, of the people up there on the hill and it, they pay a lot of money, you know, not to think right. about it. But they should be more scared of knowing that this individual that that they could help make a successful transition back into the community and aren't trying to help. Okay. Because every person, every person that we met with a mentor or that gets introduced to the process of recovery, that's one less person that's gonna come back out and commit a crime or, or do something violent to somebody else. Okay. It's not guaranteed, okay, but however, it's it's an opportunity, okay. You know, just just that one person that can get in contact with that person to get that person to change their, their thinking and their, and their behaviors, to help them assist them with that. That's one less person that that you can seem comfortable about, mm -hmm. that you know that is not going to be trying to break it down or or running my taxes up or you know causing me problems, you know, in my, in my town. So it's just something to think about. It's and you also brought up about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I could see where there would be a connection because, like I said, Ted Keller was the one who suggested for you to come here, mm -hmm. is the affordable housing, which she also is part of it for us yeah. and our municipality. So I think it would be good for you to connect up with housing partnership. Yeah. Can, uh, I, I, have to, uh, I have a 615 conference call that I'm going to have to go to. Okay. But I want to say, do you, remember, do, you, do you know a fellow named Peter Malinowski? That's why I said his name. Young guy got out of there about six years ago. 
I, I think you've got to be careful because it's public records. Yeah. Just, uh, that, uh, confidentiality issues. Uh, yeah, well, and I won't go any further with it, but, um, but it's important that there be some type of support or as much support as possible when they do get out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, in, we have in a couple of cases where there really hasn't been or or it's hard to get them to realize that they need that support, right. mm -hmm. which is the hardest part. And I really don't know how the heck you're going to do that. Um, it seems like it's it's an uphill battle, and I don't know how the um, how you would facilitate that. And I get I know what you're up against. Part Believe me. Yeah. The whether the men want the support. I mean, there's the, what used to be the drop in center in health and Amherst, there's the Amherst Community Connections. You know, yeah. I think a big part of it is the support network. And yeah. Even if that, I mean, that's something we could do is to find people in the community or in, even in the neighborhoods that be willing to help guys reintegrate. Yeah. I have, um, I have a friend in Worcester and in her neighborhood, she and a group of women, they call themselves women of a certain age. Yeah. They go to the Worcester House of Correction and they meet the men returning to their neighborhood before they get out and they say, you know, if you want to take the right path, we'll help you, you know, yeah. if you choose to, you know, try to change and do right. It was actually started by a woman who lost her son in a gang violence. And rather than mm -hmm. getting bitter and angry and then whatever, she started this, this group. You know, so sounding really familiar. I, I, I believe I've read about this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, hmm. So there's, there's, there's two, I think of it as like two two areas. There's the, the kind of the paid services, you know, like the, the uh, uh, professional services, and then there's the, the more the voluntary community effort, you yeah. know, where people can get involved. Hmm. Like, like I meant being a mentor or sponsor, yeah. or just as a, uh, I know in Vermont they have circles of support where a group of people will kind of get together to help somebody come back. Yeah. Brattleboro has a huge one. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Jesus. Um, well, look at. Well, I want to thank you very much for right. um, attending Social Services and Veterans Affairs, and just get a hold of us counselors. And I would highly suggest that you work with Pet Keller and the Affordable Housing. Okay. Yeah. You know, especially you know, okay, so housing yeah. partnership. Right. You could go in there and talk with them about the mentoring and mm -hmm. how you need to right. place. Uh, patients. Carl, that's contact information if you want to. Thank you. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, sir. All right. We'll be in touch, I'm sure. Look forward to it. Thank you oh, very much. Thanks, Ruth. Nice to meet you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Keep writing this fight. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. I learned something that I didn't know about. Could you spell your last name for me so I get it right for the record? Well, Nancy Gonzalez. I don't I don't know what happened to her. Oh, um, the integration She was scheduled for last month, but she couldn't make it, so we booked her for liaison. October, and she said, yes, it was fine, so I don't know what happened to her. But anyway, we don't have any public comment. That's me. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Tim? Yep. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's from Dash and you know me sometimes if you walk to. Uh, actually, I'd like to get involved a little more and walk the walk with myself mm. instead of uh, just recommending. So, yeah, keep, keep in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Take care, gents. Yeah, have a good evening. For the agenda for Thank next you. month, we have um, the Harrison House and the Gandera House coming in. Okay. And Kurt McDermott. Do you know him? No. Pat Keller knows him very well, and he does like an open table, and he's coming in November also. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. Well, then uh, make a motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Ruth.